The Presidencies of the United States is a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Presidencies of the United States. I'm your host, Jerry Landry. Now, this is actually part two of the James Madison episode because there is, of course, so much to cover with James Madison. We decided to go ahead and break this up into two episodes. Understandable. He he did a few things in life, you know, just a little <laughs> he, he wasn't a slacker like I am. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Agreed. It's like looking at James Madison's life, it's like, I feel like I haven't done enough here. <laughs> It's that that's the problem with history. You get some of those folks who just make it be like, man, maybe I don't have to play video games tonight. Maybe I don't have to go to the movies. Maybe I should be a bit more productive. But, uh, you know, they're here to entertain us with their stories. Absolutely. And so, as you can hear, I'm joined again by Kenny Ryan of the Abridged Presidential Histories podcast. Kenny, thank you so much for coming back for James Madison Part Two. It's a pleasure to be here. And just in case we have anybody who decided that they really didn't care about James Madison part one, if you just take a second, and (laughs) I don't know why anybody would do that, but just in case, if you wouldn't mind sharing with the audience a little bit about your podcast. Oh, sure. My podcast is Abridged Presidential Histories, and the concept is I do an episode on every president in order, and I I cover their life, their accomplishment, their successes, their scandals, their failures, all in an hour or less in chronological order. And then also, about halfway through the series, I started adding interviews with historians. So after I do my episode, I'll do some uh, historian interviews to dive a little bit deeper on some of those topics that are just really interesting and really deserve further conversation. And I cannot recommend Abridged Presidential Histories enough. Around the time of the release of this episode, I will be sharing information about Kenny's podcast on my social media. So please be sure to check that out after you get done with this episode. But Speaking of this episode, so we are going to pick back up where we left off with the life of James Madison. So just to let everybody know, we are taking a little deeper of a dive into his time as Secretary of State, and we left off at the Louisiana Purchase with the last episode, and so we'll be picking up from there. Now, I will have a final section on his time after he left the cabinet. He had quite a bit going on after he left the cabinet, as we'll see. Yeah, But it's going to be an abridged version because we are actually covering that in the narrative and you'll get much more detail there, but we will finish <laughs> up. Spoilers his- tag. Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> Spoilers. There's a lot coming up, but we will finish up his time as secretary of state, wrap up an abridged version of his later life, and then we will evaluate him. I can't wait to judge him. I love <laughs> judging other people. This is going to be so fun. <laughs> See, that is one of the fun things about the Seat at the Table series. (laughs) (laughs) You can say how you really feel about some of these characters. (laughs) Yep. All right. So let's pick back up where we left off with Madison's tenure as Secretary of State. So at the end of the last episode, we covered the Louisiana Purchase, which was, of course, one of the big foreign policy achievements of the Jefferson administration, and we discussed Madison's role in that. But as things were wrapping up with that, Secretary of State Madison found himself in the middle of another international kerfuffle in the Capitol. This one involved the new British minister to the United States, who was a man by the name of Anthony Mary. Going against the name, Mary wasn't so merry. <laughs> not a jolly fellow. He was not a jolly fellow. Because Mary was a man who was on the rise in the British diplomatic corps. And at this point, the assignment to Washington, D.C. was not seen as being one that you would really want because Washington, D.C. was at that time a literal swamp. Oh, yeah. That, that was like the equivalent to they just imagine the most podunk end of the world like assignment you can get. That was the United States back then, which is such a delightful reminder whenever we can get there. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so here Mary was, he was a man on the rise. And then you get that call, you're going to the United States. (laughs) No. (laughs) Oh, yeah. No. (laughs) 
there was already this inherent lack of enthusiasm on Mary's part to this new assignment. Mm -hmm. And then he actually got to Washington, D.C. Now, I should go ahead and preface before I say what's coming next by the fact that this wasn't just isolated to Mary, you know, the encounter that he's about to have. Because... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> basically you know besides just being a literal swamp this was mm. also an early time in the u.s government and there was a decided lack of pomp and circumstance when it came to what in european circles would be seen as a big event and so you know mary was used to you go and get received by whoever the head of state is you're in a horse-drawn carriage, you're coming up you know, to this palace, you're going through all these fancy rooms. Instead, he met the Secretary of State, who was, of course, James Madison at the State Department, and the two just kind of made their way over to the White House, which was not so well furnished. You know, I, I suddenly have this image in my head of, you mentioned how early it is in Rough and Tumble, of the United States like governing through Animal House. <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> and it's just like a bunch of dudes, like in t-shirts on like old couches, you know, being like, remember when the Germans bombs Pearl Harbor, you know, like, I think that's what he's walking into. And he's just not expecting that. He's expecting the nice club. He's expecting, you know, the preppy boys. Uh, and instead he gets Animal House. And that's, that's where it starts to go downhill. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and and of course, you know, there's got to be togas because the folks in the early Republic loved talking about the Romans. Oh, yeah. And so naturally, there are going to be togas that they just pulled their bed sheets and turned them into togas, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, here's Madison leading Mary to the president's house and they go in and he's greeted by President Jefferson, who was in his house coat and slippers. Animal House. Animal House. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) This is the treatment that he's getting. And so naturally, Mary takes offense at this. He's like, you're doing this just to spite me because you don't like the British. We know Jefferson doesn't like the British. Right. But the thing was, he wasn't the only diplomat who was received that way. (laughs) And so that's it wasn't technically personal against Mary. Right. But then there was the dinner. Because, of course, Mm. you know, you've got this new foreign diplomat coming in. It's customary for the president to have a dinner in their honor. And he didn't see the ceremonial food fight coming. It happens (laughs) all the time. (laughs) This wasn't the way things were done in London. (laughs) And so he gets to this dinner. And again, so used to traditional conventions would be that the president would escort in the guest of honor's wife. And they would be seated at a certain place at the table. Likewise, the guest of honor would take whoever the hostess was and they would lead them in and have a certain assigned seating. Jefferson had decided in consultation with Madison, he didn't want that formality. That was mm. that was too grandiose, aristocratic, royalist. Instead, he decided on a social style that he called pell-mell. So when it came time to be called to dinner, instead of this formal, the most important people go in first and have their assigned seating, it was first come, first serve. So you just find a seat wherever you want to find a seat. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, the Marys are just standing there while everybody's rushing into the dining room. They're just standing there waiting to be (laughs) escorted in. What, what's this really the story just gets so much more fun when I just picture it as all animal house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, 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 that's that's exactly how they uh, how they felt about it. They were like, these people are barbarians. This is these people are animals. What, these people are animals. What is going on here? Where's the dean? Where's the dean? <laughs> You you imagine he wanted to write a strongly worded letter to somebody in authority, which he did write back to the British government and told them all this and exactly how he felt about it. Yeah. Yeah. And it didn't help that Jefferson had also invited 
to this dinner that was supposed to be held in Anthony Mary's honor, he invited the French minister to the U.S. So Mm. at this point, the British and French had been at war for years. They had had a one-year peace, but they were back at war. And so at this dinner that the British minister to the U.S. is supposed to be held in his honor is the last person that he wanted to see. Absolutely. It's like, hey, let, let's invite you over for dinner and your ex, who you, <laughs> you hate and you're fighting. You're technically at war, maybe, you know, like, yeah, yeah, I'll just, uh, let's just make this really uncomfortable for everybody. Yeah, not awkward at all. And true to form in this Jeffersonian small or Republican ideal for America, they would find a similar arrangement soon after when the Madisons invited them over for a dinner. And so it just gets to the point, Mary is just feeling like, okay, this administration just hates me and they are doing this stuff out of spite. Mm -hmm. And so for the remainder of his tenure in Washington, D.C., he mostly hung out with the Federalists who were the anti-Jeffersonian. Oh, yeah. The Federalists. They were the nice frat in town. They were the ones with the nice polos and, you know. Everybody yes. drinks champagne glasses at their parties. Absolutely. They were the ones who had the nice garden parties and you don't wear white before Labor Day. And yeah. Right. Oh, oh <laughs> ghastly. They, they knew the rules and yeah. followed them to a T. Absolutely. And they spoke like this. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So... This is kind of a diplomatic problem because, you know, at this point, (laughs) Mm -hmm. Britain is still our largest trading partner. They're still one of the key partners in the global economy for the U.S. So the fact that you just Mm -hmm. teed off their representative, that's a problem. Hi, listeners. My name's Ray Suarez, and I wanted to take a moment to tell you about another podcast from Evergreen Podcasts, the things I thought about when my body was trying to kill me. In this podcast, I share with you a personal story over the several months where I had to think hard about the end. Join me, Ray Suarez, as I journey through this battle with cancer on my new podcast. Listen to the things I thought about when my body was trying to kill me by following us on your favorite podcast app today. But even worse than the Jefferson administration's relations with Anthony Mary were the United States relations with Spain. (laughs) So at this point, Spain was not too pleased with the U S because of the Louisiana purchase. So the way the Louisiana purchase happened Spain held the Louisiana colony. Mm -hmm. They signed a secret treaty to turn it over to France with the caveat, you cannot sell it to the United States. Oopsie. As soon as that treaty was done, Napoleon approached the United States about selling Louisiana to it. So they were not pleased about that because especially considering that they had other colonies in the Americas, Ceding this big territory to the United States, it put those other colonies at risk, especially the ones that were bordering it. Yeah. And France is just like, you know, possession is nine tenths of international law. (laughs) (laughs) That is something that Napoleon would say. And the the other tenth was what Napoleon wanted. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) And the other tenth is, screw you. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) <laughs> you you know Napoleon so well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but meanwhile, the U.S. wasn't really too happy with Spain either because Spain had allowed the French to condemn American ships that they had seized in Spanish ports. Mm. Now, while France and Spain were technically allies, the United States was not at war with either of them. And so, you know, the United States is like, we are neutral in your conflict. Why are you taking our ships and why are you basically selling them, impounding them and all this? And they said, because possession is nine tenths of the international law. (laughs) You got it. You got it. And so when U.S. diplomats complained to Spain about this, quote, 
Spain replied that a royal order denied prize court powers to French consuls on Spanish soil. And the American official said, well, that's great that that's the law, but you're not enforcing it. So that's the problem. Mm -hmm. You actually need to enforce your law. Are you going to do that? We don't want (laughs) to. We don't want to because France would not like that. Right. (laughs) So, you know, we have these certain issues that they're having problems with one another with. And with the Louisiana Purchase, Madison and the administration saw an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Rather than go through the process of negotiating a settlement to the claims related to the American ships that had been condemned in Spanish ports, why not just have the U.S. government provide compensation for those losses to those merchants, Hmm. which is a very generous offer. And if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. So the Jefferson administration would be completely happy to do that if, of course, Spain agreed to give the U.S. West Florida, which the Americans thought was theirs already through the Louisiana Purchase. So give us this territory. We'll pay off these claims. Everything will be good. Right. We'll stop asking you for money. <laughs> we'll stop asking you for money. <laughs> but as Madison biographer Irving Brandt put it, though, quote, the real problem was to make Spain give up a province she intended to keep in exchange for cancellation of a debt she did not intend to pay. Yeah. This is like me walking up to you and being like, hey, Jerry, you owe me ten dollars. And you're being like, what? No, I don't. And being like, but don't worry, I'll forgive it if you give me your car. <laughs> You got it. And 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 he was like, what are you talking about? (laughs) We're not doing any of that. We are not doing any of that. God, Spain, you are so difficult right now. Why can't you just be cool? (laughs) Just be cool. Give me the car. Give me the car. (laughs) Give the $10. It's okay. It's okay. I'll I'll forgive it. (laughs) While all of this was going on, Meanwhile, people on both sides of the conflict were doing all they could to ratchet up the tension. (laughs) Really helpful. (laughs) Yeah, I know. It's like, thanks, guys. You're, you know, we're trying to resolve this, but you're just making it worse. That that conversation we just, you know, simulated. And then some other person walks up and he's like, Kenny, you should just swing at him. Just throw a swing, (laughs) Kenny. And I'm like, well, hold on. I'm just trying to get the car for the $10. It's cool. Like, you're going to be cool, right? Yeah. (laughs) No, no. I'll hold him down. I'll hold him down. (laughs) So, first of all, we had Spanish officials who had been in charge of Louisiana prior to the transfer dragging their feet about actually vacating the former colony. So, Mm -hmm. the American officials were like, hey, guys, we've been here for a bit now. You really should go. And they're like, well, we're just hanging out. We're just hanging out. (laughs) And the American officials were kind of uneasy about this, especially since some of them were armed troops. They're like, okay, are you planning something? Are you going to try and take back over? No, 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 no. We're cool. We're cool. We're just hanging here. We're just hanging here. It's basically the the inspiration behind the French castle in Monty Python. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> exactly. It's a French castle. What are you doing here? Mind your own business. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what they're saying. Mind your own business. Meanwhile, the former Spanish intendant at New Orleans set up a land office in that city after the transfer to American control in order to sell land in West Florida, which the U.S. claimed. So you were selling land that the U.S. claimed while on U.S. territory, (laughs) and you were pocketing the money. Okay. And so that was a problem, and it also created competition for the U.S. government because they had American land to sell. And meanwhile, all these people are buying up land in West Florida, and that money's not going to the U.S. government. <laughs> so so I want Jerry's car. Jerry won't give it to me. We both listed it on Turo for rent, and this is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> this is a problem. <laughs> so you can see, it, it's, it's just, it's getting worse and worse. Mm. The U.S. didn't do things to really help matters either, because... A bill was passed called the Mobile Act in early 1804, which was designed to extend revenue laws to the land newly acquired from France. However, 
The bill's author, who is our old friend, Representative John Randolph of Roanoke, made sure that it extended the Mississippi Customs District to include, quote, all the navigable waters, rivers, creeks, bays, and inlets lying within the United States, which empty into the Gulf of Mexico east of the River Mississippi. Mm-hmm. Now, though it didn't state as such, technically that description included West Florida. Mm-hmm. As if that wasn't enough, the act also granted the president the authority, quote, to create a separate customs district embracing the shores, waters, and inlets of the Bay and River of Mobile. That was firmly West Florida. And hey, this is like how Europe's supposed to do this, where they just write a law and say that land's ours now. You know, North America, Americans, you got to like lay off. Calm down now. <laughs> oh, they're like, you know, Spain, you're European. You know how it goes. We're just going to claim yeah. your land right now. We're claim your land. It's ours now. We're just going to claim it. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, President Jefferson, as a proponent of westward expansion, decided that the U.S. needed to explore west of the Mississippi River, even if that meant going into Spanish territory. Oh, no. I need, I need to learn some Spanish for this episode. <laughs> I know, right? Por qué? <laughs> Por qué? All I can think is mon dieu, and that's French, but <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they probably would have understood that. But. Yeah, so the first one is, of course, an expedition that most people know, the Lewis and Clark expedition. The Spanish were rather upset about that because technically they were claiming some of the lands that Lewis and Clark were going into and they really didn't know exactly where they were going. So it could be that they ended up in Spanish territory. And so the Spanish actually sent out agents to try and get Lewis and Clark. And was one of them like Luthor? (laughs) I will get you Lewis and Clark. (laughs) And then they sent General Zod, and <laughs> you went through the entire Superman series of villains. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. The whole Rogues Gallery, <laughs> the whole Rogues Gallery. Yeah. So, as we know, the Spanish agents did not intercept the Lewis and Clark expedition, but the Freeman Custis expedition of 1806 was not so lucky. They were charged with finding the headwaters of the Red River but they were intercepted after they crossed into Spanish territory. Now, at this point, standing orders were to fire on foreign armed troops in Spanish territory. This expedition was armed, and they were agents of the U.S. government. So the commander on the ground could have said, ready, aim, fire. Mm -hmm. Instead, he decided, let's go ahead and, and take the cooler approach. Guys, just turn around, go back the way you came, We'll forget that this happened. But, you know, this is getting really bad. I mean, we we are having potential. This could lead to war. Then there was the Pike Expedition of 1806 and 1807, which managed to get even deeper into Spanish territory, into kind of what is now New Mexico. And they were captured and they were temporarily jailed in Chihuahua before, as a sign of good faith, they were released and returned to the U.S. And again, this is a situation that technically, this was an act of war. You were invading Spanish territory. This is not good. What was the name of the earlier one? Freeman and and Custis? What was it? Freeman and Custis. And Custis. I'm just going to say, it's kind of a good thing those guys got captured, because imagine if like Superman's name was Custis. That would just be very (laughs) weird. Uh, But Lewis and Clark is much happier that they, they were this successful. Exactly. You know, it, it, Lewis and Clark rolls off the tongue. Freeman oh, Custis. Uh... Freeman and Custis. Mm-mm, mm-mm. <laughs> no, Superman never would have taken off with that name. It's kind of like Transformers versus GoBots. Freeman <laughs> right. Custis are the GoBots. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a very good comparison. <laughs> Poor GoBots. <laughs> Poor GoBots. So this is just, this is an increasing problem. Americans stop sending armed troops into our territory. Around that same time period that these latter two expeditions were setting out, Spanish troops started amassing by the Sabine River within striking distance of the American town of Natchitoches. Mm. Now, hearing reports of this troop buildup on the disputed border, American troops were ordered to the region, 
and they were commanded by another old friend of the podcast, General James Wilkinson. Hey, you're a traitor. <laughs> and you're, you're a traitor to the Spanish. <laughs> yeah, let's play all the sides. It's a great place to be. Someone who will play all the sides for his own profit. Let's just plop him right down in the middle of a of a hostile border situation with two massing armies. Let's do it. Let's see what happens. It, it's going to work out well, right? Right. Actually, this is one of the few times that James Wilkinson did the right thing. Yay, Wilkinson. So he decided... He actually negotiated a de-escalation. So let's go ahead and move some of these troops out. Let's go ahead and let's cool down a bit. And just for safe measure, let's establish this area as a neutral zone. And that agreement actually kept the peace on the border for quite some time. So Wilkinson actually did something good for once. Thanks, Jim. We don't get to say that that often. <laughs> like to highlight it whenever we can. So. How did Secretary of State Madison fit into all this, you ask? Well, he was on the receiving end of the constant barrage of formal protests by Spanish minister to the U.S. Arujo. And the two would go through various back and forth sessions about all this, as well as American claims to West Florida. So mm -hmm. he was fielding the official complaints, responses, all of that. Mm-hmm. Madison would work behind the scenes, sometimes coordinating with Secretary of the Treasury Gallatin, to try to find some areas of give and take and to keep administration officials from going too far in antagonizing the Spanish in order to keep things from devolving into a war that neither side wanted. But he was also firm in defending the American position on certain key issues. So you see Madison as the pragmatist saying, okay, well, we've got this little thing. It's not really a big deal. We're not going to make a big deal about this. This is really what we want. Let's mm -hmm. go ahead and focus in on this, but we'll let that one go for the time being and really trying to work across the administration. Okay, guys, let's pull this back a bit. We don't need war. Yeah. Yet. Yet. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> Ultimately, in April 1804, Urujo, after giving Madison a piece of his mind, quote, closed his house in Washington, D.C., and left for Pennsylvania without calling on the secretary, as was customary. And he stayed gone for the remainder of his term. So for the next few years, there was no Spanish minister to the U.S. in Washington. The first instance of quiet quitting in U.S. history right there. It's like, yeah, I'm still going to cash my paycheck. I'm just not going to show up for work anymore. I'm just not going to. I'm just going to move over there. I'm just going to hang out over there. I'm going to do whatever I want over there. Just keep sending the paycheck. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, his relations with diplomats are not going too well. He's got Anthony Mary, who's still there, but is just sitting in the corner resentful. And then yep. you've got a who just said, whatever I'm out. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this isn't going well managed to keep us out of war, but, but, <laughs> but. <laughs> so as the Jefferson administration went on, Madison wasn't just faced with antagonism from foreign diplomats as described by Brandt quote, Madison was becoming dominant in the cabinet but the general unity between him and Gallatin made them joint targets for most party dissidents. If you'll recall the election of 1800 and all of that build up, the Democratic Republican Party coming together and rallying around Jefferson mm -hmm. and Madison was a key leader as well. They had brought all these folks together, but now that they were in office, now that they actually had control of the executive branch, they started to realize, yeah, some of those ideas that we had, they don't really work out so well in practice. <laughs> you know, we were really against the National Bank, but it's doing good things. Maybe maybe we shouldn't go ahead and end the National Bank. Mm -hmm. So now you've got some of the people in the party who are like, wait, what are you saying now? The National Bank's a good thing. Wait, all those things you promised me to get elected, you don't want to do them anymore? <laughs> Why not? Exactly. <laughs> and so you have these people in the party that are starting to say, what is going on? Now, 
we can see this from a historical lens and, you know, we've seen numerous instances in future administrations where, you know, once you're in power, oh, yeah. things are different. You have to make decisions and you have to be pragmatic at times. And that's what Madison and Gallatin were. They were pragmatists. They felt that sometimes the ends justified the means and the compromise didn't have to be a bad thing if it helped to further along your goals. You know, let's go. We're not going to get 100% of what we want right now, but mm-hmm. if we can get like 60%, that's good enough for now. Yeah. But Madison's enemies didn't see it that way. And they didn't like that this guy was such a big influence on President Jefferson, who mm-hmm. they felt was their guy. And of course, if Madison wasn't talking in his ear, he'd be doing things different. There's such a, a rich tradition in, in like the English culture of it's not the top guy who's the bad guy. Top guy is great. It's his advisors. If only you could get rid of, you know, like like even the American Revolution. It's like, no, no, no. The king is king's a nice guy. It's just that parliament, you know, this cabinet. Like they're, they're the ones who are bad. Took them a while to be like, no, we don't like the king. We're over him. <laughs> oh, it really is him. <laughs> yeah, it really is him. Oh, shit. Oops. <laughs> well, and, and we saw this in the Washington presidency, you know, everybody's like, oh, well, George Washington, of course he isn't a federalist. Of course he doesn't have these ideas. It's just Hamilton or it's just Pickering, yeah. you know, and no, no, it was, it was Washington. He wasn't mm-hmm. duped by anybody. Right. But, you know, in that same line, in that same token, Madison was the bad guy. And so right. his enemies would attack him, and sometimes in very personal ways. Given that his marriage to Dolly remained a childless one, malicious rumors circulated time and again that James was infertile and impotent, and he would be attacked as not being a real man at a time when masculinity and honor among men were important in American political circles, and arguably has that time really ended. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) It's like, that sounds familiar. But especially in this, it's like, this is a big thing. They also didn't limit their attacks to James. And again, you know, this may sound familiar to folks in later eras of American politics and history. Accusations flew that President Jefferson had made arrangements for Dolly Madison and her sister Anna to entertain certain foreign visitors in a very hey. private sense. Oh. Yeah. You know, we think of dirty politics and these dirty attacks as being relatively recent. No, they've been around for quite a while. I'm reading a uh, biography on Ike right now, Eisenhower. And at one point he writes Truman a letter and he's like, Ever since I announced I was running for president, they're so mean to me. They're they're saying I'm a communist drinking buddy of this guy. They're and saying that, saying like, and he lists like three things. And Truman's like, oh, if that's it, you're pretty lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Truman knew right. better than anybody at the you're time. Gonna, you're you're going to get all sorts of crazy <laughs> stuff thrown at you. You got to get some tough skin. Are you sure you really want this president thing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're going to be mean. Yeah. And so Madison was learning this firsthand at this time. But despite this, the Madisons played a unique role in the Jefferson years as the social center of Washington society. And especially since Jefferson was a widower. So at that time, you know, the previous two administrations, it had been the president's wife who had been kind of the hostess. They needed a hostess to be able to have mixed company. So, you know, dinners and parties with men and women. And so Dolly Madison as the next person on the wrong, because, you know, his first vice president, Burr, was also a widower. Dolly Madison stepped into this role as kind of the stand-in hostess for any events that Jefferson needed to host. She also hosted at her own table. And as described by Dolly Madison biographer Catherine Algor, quote, If Americans across the country hoped that the two warring parties were reconciling in Jefferson's Washington, the only venue where that took place was Dolly's table. She did her best to bring everyone in the Capitol, locals, officials, and visitors, together under her roof. In contrast to Jefferson's carefully calibrated events, 
The Madisons invited men of both parties to the house on F Street. The Madisons' dinner parties were also mixed men and women. By their very presence, women softened the tone of political rhetoric while paradoxically forwarding the opportunities for political wheeling and dealing. So this is something like even in those days, that idea of the social sphere also Mm -hmm. playing a role in politics, very much alive and the Madisons very much fed into that and were leading figures in that. Yeah. And you you start to see why Dolly is so important to James's career. Mm Mm-hmm. Exactly, because this is nothing but a good thing if James Madison has ambitions beyond being Secretary Mm -hmm. of State. But before we get to that, we need to discuss one time that Madison actually put something else before his duties and obligations to Thomas Jefferson. A few months after Jefferson's second inauguration in 1805, Dolly Madison starts to suffer from some health issues. Mm. Specifically, as described by David Mattern and Holly Shulman, quote, an ulcerated knee, which soon needed serious medical attention. So Dolly is having these serious issues, and typically for the summer, they would go back to Montpelier. But this time they decide to go north to Philadelphia because that's where the leading physicians of the nation could be found. Biggest city, maybe the biggest city. New York might be bigger at that point. I can't remember when New York passes Philly. I think also, is that where uh, the was, Spanish ambassador is now? Yeah. So <laughs> maybe he can go and see Arujo. Say hi. Yeah. We miss you Arujo. in Washington. <laughs> Arujo's like, oh, uh, I'm moving to New York now. But <laughs> <laughs> You picture Arujo seeing him on the street and just crossing over to the other side. Right. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, let me get yeah, that he, newspaper. <laughs> I like, got that scene from like Groundhog Day where, where Arujo is Bill Murray just trying to cross the street. And all of a sudden... <laughs> Madison was like, it's me, Ned. Ned, ah, ah, ah. Yeah, and he's just like, mm, no, bye. bye. Yeah. But yeah, so they, they're in Philadelphia and they enlist the services of Dr. Philip Singh Physic, who, in addition to being a professor of surgery at the University of Pennsylvania, was also a prominent physician. Now, Dr. Physic was sure that he could cure Dolly, but the treatment would take months. And rather than abandon his wife, because, you know, at that time and, you know, the ideas of marriage have shifted over time. At that time, there were some marriages that love was there, but that wasn't seen as kind of the primary reason to be married. It was more connections, having children. Huge tracts of land. (laughs) Huge tracts of land. Yeah. You know, let's, let's find that wealthy widow. But you can tell here, you get a sense of the affection between James and Dolly because James is like, I don't care. I'm staying here and I'm taking care of Dolly. And (laughs) on the flip side, the options before James Madison was stay in the swamp that's Washington, D.C. or spend some time in the metropolis of Philadelphia. So, <laughs> huh, yeah. what? I really, no, yeah, I really sorry, love I'd love Dolly. to come back to the swamp, but I got I to gotta take care of my wife here. <laughs> well, and that's the thing. Like he had Jefferson and other administration officials sending him these letters. He was trying to telecommute and trying to do all he could from Philadelphia to run the State Department, which... As we discussed in the first episode, the State Department was responsible for quite a lot in the early Republic. Yeah. And so everybody's like, look, we really need you back. He kept saying no. He was like, look, I'm not leaving Dolly's side. Sorry, you're just going to have to make it work. Finally, in October, Dolly is starting to recover. She's getting better. She's recovering. And James is like, okay, we're at a point where... I think I can leave safely. You're going to be fine. Whenever you get done, you know, we'll have some folks bring you home. And so he leaves and goes back to Washington, takes back up things at the State Department. But this is also an interesting time in their relationship because for most of their marriage and up until this point, like they have been married for 12 years They had not been separated like this. And so we finally have a correspondence between the two as they're separated. And for scholars nowadays, historical scholars, 
this is a wealth of information about the relationship between James and Dolly. This is us actually getting to see more of the intimate side of their relationship. So mm-hmm. this was a pivotal time, you know, not just in, in his career and trying to balance work and home life, but also we get this insight into them. Now, Madison was involved in what became a minor scandal for the administration a couple of months later. In December 1805, he, along with President Jefferson and other prominent administration and congressional leaders, met with a foreign visitor named Francisco de Miranda. Mmm, Miranda. Miranda. Now, while it's beyond our scope to go into too much detail about Miranda, Just know that he had been going around the U.S. and Western Europe for quite some time trying to get support for a revolution in what is now Venezuela. He wanted to establish independence from Spanish rule. Thus, it's difficult to imagine, you know, he's been talking with any leader who will sit down with him about this. It's difficult to think that he didn't talk to Jefferson and Madison about this. And if, if I remember right, I think Miranda might have been like a, a tutor or a mentor of like uh, Bolivar, who, you know, later yes. would eventually free all this stuff. So this is it's not just a name. This is an important guy in uh, the history of that region. Exactly. He was the inspiration for what became, you know, Simon Bolivar and and the revolutions in South America. Yeah. Yeah. This is an important guy. But at this time, he's still seeking that. He's still right. trying to, to build support. <laughs> now, what created the scandal and the diplomatic issue was on February 2nd, 1806, a ship carrying Miranda and a group of supporters on what was well known to be an expedition to secure Venezuelan independence from Spain was allowed to leave New York Harbor without any questions asked by U.S. officials. Mm-hmm. Everybody in town knew what was going on. And U.S. officials just said, safe travels. (laughs) Are those cannons on your ship? No, these are the latest vases. These are European vases. You just, we're just storing them on their side like this. It's good for them. (laughs) We didn't see those vases. (laughs) (laughs) Now, Miranda's expedition was quickly quashed when they got on the ground. They actually made it there, but it didn't last long. And many involved, including... Bay of Pigs Alpha. (laughs) Exactly. It was this embarrassment, and especially since there were some American citizens in the mix. Oops. So that was a problem. And so Jefferson was between a rock and a hard place because, you know, you've got the Spanish, of course, are not happy. Other diplomats are not happy because they're like, you're sending revolutionaries to other parts of the world. Are you going to do that with French colonies or British colonies? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then also he's facing pressure at home because they're, you know, folks, of course, are advocating these are American citizens. You need to seek their release. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so they had to balance all this. And ultimately, the American citizens were released and the Jefferson administration did prosecute. Also, some of the U.S. officials who it was found out were involved were removed from office. So Mm. Jefferson and Madison had to do some cleanup here and try and balance things, but they were ultimately able to kind of get past the scandal period of this. And it's, it's interesting because Jefferson is so often like puts on the airs of world revolutionary kind of like, he's like, we need to support France because France is, you know, a a Republic and we need to support the spread of Republicanism, you know, everywhere. And, And here he's like, he's pulling it back a little bit. It's interesting. Yeah. And again, This is where we get to, you know, folks, oh, well, why is Jefferson doing that? Oh, that's right. Madison's whispering in his ear, and he's not really that big of a revolutionary. He's not really a true Republican. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that brings us to, you know, as the Jefferson administration was winding on, and this was his second term, Jefferson made it clear, I'm not running for a third term. Two terms, that's enough. And so they started thinking about, well, who's going to replace him? Well, Jefferson knew the one person that he wanted to replace him. His friend, his colleague, his right-hand man, James Madison. 
But just because Madison was starting to think of the presidency and starting to think of how to get election, this didn't mean he could just phone it in at the State Department for the next couple of years. (laughs) Right. Especially since tensions were ramping up with Great Britain beginning in 1807. So on June 22nd of that year, the USS Chesapeake, while sailing out of Norfolk, Virginia, bound for the Mediterranean, was confronted by the British ship, the HMS Leopard, and a demand was made by the British captain to search the American ship for British naval deserters. Now, this was becoming an increasing problem. This practice was called impressment. And basically, it came out of necessity for the British Navy. The British Navy had been engaged for years with war with France. Mm -hmm. They needed to maintain a naval superiority, but you can't do that without actual people serving on the ships. Yep. And British citizens were starting to say, eh, we're not really excited about this. And so they, they were hearing how poorly those sailors are being treated. You know, it is like it is rough <laughs> to be in the British Navy in those days. It was brutal conditions and the pay was better on American ships. And so wow. this is where you get kind of a problem It that. They weren't as strict in discipline, and you have more pay on American ships. What are you going to choose? And at the time, it was not as easy to prove your citizenship. You know, diplomats had passports, but most people, you didn't have any identification to say, I'm American, I'm British. Right. The State Department started coming up with some of that whenever impressment started to become an issue, but even with that, the British officials would just look and say, oh, well, you obviously forged this. This is just a piece of paper. No, this is a piece of paper from the U.S. government. Well, I say it's just a piece of paper that you forged. Yeah, Uh, You're speaking English. You must be an Englishman who fled the Navy, and I'm bringing you back. And especially at the time when the American accent wasn't nearly as strong or different from the British accent. So, yeah. This is a problem. And, you know, increasingly American diplomats are trying to get something done, but the British have no reason to stop impressment. If they stop impressment, the British Navy is going to suffer. So, yeah. yeah. And oh, by the way, you're the United States. You barely have a Navy. So, <laughs> what's you going to do about it anyway? Yeah. <laughs> and so, this is a problem. And further, the British government started to adopt a stance of not seeing British citizens who were naturalized as U.S. citizens as legitimate. Ooh. Their stance was once British, always British, period, point blank. And so this is ramping up to be a big thing. And then you have the Chesapeake Leopard Affair. And what really made this egregious To that point, impressment had happened against U.S. merchant vessels. Mm -hmm. This was a ship of the U.S. Navy that the British (laughs) Navy is boarding and taking people off of. This is bad. This is bad. Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, the Commodore in charge, he Commodore James Barron, he naturally refused this order from the British. They fired on the Chesapeake, board it. And took off, they impressed three Americans and one actual British citizen. So there were cases that these were actually deserters, yeah. but in many cases they weren't. They were American citizens who had never served in the British Navy and just couldn't, they were like, oh no, no, you're that guy. Yeah, what, one out of four, that's not bad, right? One out of four? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They're pretty good, 25%. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and so... You can imagine, you know, the embarrassment and how the U.S. citizenry reacted to this. I mean, this was a big slap in the face. And so the Jefferson administration had to come up with a proper response. The answer that they came up with had been an intellectual pipe dream of Jefferson's and Madison's for years. So Congress had already put into place the Non-Importation Act of 1806 prior to this, which forbade the import of certain British goods, but it was by and large seen as a weak and ineffective attempt at economic coercion. But Jefferson and Madison had thought for years, they had this great idea. 
If the problem was that the British kept impressing American sailors on the high seas, why not ensure that there are no American sailors on the high seas? (laughs) That's right. Their idea was to end all foreign export trade with the rest of the world. Brilliant. (laughs) Now, to be fair to them, you know, in the 20th and 21st century, you know, economic coercion is seen as part of a larger foreign policy mm. schema. You know, we, okay, we say that this nation is doing something that's wrong. Maybe we ban the sale of, you know, weapons or something to try and coerce them to come around to our way of thinking. That's yeah. now seen as a thing. Because we're a large trading partner and we have that gravitas. Yeah. At this point, we didn't have that. You know what just struck me is that this is also what we had done before the Revolutionary War broke out, you know, that started with a bunch of like kind of voluntary, uh, like Boston Tea Party type things, you know, like let's stop drinking British tea, let's stop consuming these British products. That started with these kind of economic embargoes as well. Mm-hmm. And it didn't work. You still had a war. So I don't know why they would be like, oh, let's just go harder on this. But uh, yeah, it, it seems to have been a very American thing back then. Um, oh, yes. Especially for a country that had no army, <laughs> you know, barely had a navy. Um, I mean, I guess they had, they had some troops all out on the West Front, though, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. And the Jefferson administration, that's exactly what they wanted. They wanted the troops to be out in the West dealing with native peoples and all of that, the frontier issues. They wanted a gunboat Navy that was just for self-defense, not able to travel across the Atlantic and engage in wars in oh, the Mediterranean. Unless Tripoli. Unless it's Tripoli. Unless it's, cool. it's Tripoli. It's cool then it's cool. <laughs> that's yeah. cool. but yeah so they knew realistically the u.s could not afford war we we weren't ready for it so let's try this thing you know kudos for trying outside of the box thinking i appreciate that it's a terrible (laughs) idea but you know you try it's a terrible idea because First of all, it greatly overestimated British and because they they also thought, well, you know, we've got some problems with the French. Why not kill two birds with one stone? Let's go ahead and we'll include the French in this as well. They'll capitulate as well. Well, they greatly overestimated British and French dependence on raw materials from the U.S. Because basically Britain and France were like, okay, well, we can't get it from the U.S., Guess what? We've got other trading partners. We've got other colonies. We can we can get this from somewhere else. Yeah. Second, if the intent was to shut down all foreign trade, it was a relatively easy matter to make sure that ships didn't leave the major US harbors or any new ships come in. Mm-hmm. But there was this problem about this border to the north that stretched over hundreds and hundreds of miles. And was unguarded. And you could move back and forth between Canada and the U.S. And finally, Jefferson and Madison didn't really account for the damage that would be done to the American economy, which was heavily dependent on foreign trade, especially in certain places like New England. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So all in all, this plan, which became the Embargo Act, was a disaster and ran counter to Jefferson's economic policy. Public expenditure skyrocketed as the administration struggled to enforce the embargo. So we don't have troops or anything to be able to fight a full war, but Mm -hmm. let's get some extra troops to enforce the embargo against our own people. Right. Which, yeah. But it's also like, how are we going to pay for that? Because, you know, we we get most of our revenue (laughs) from tariffs, and now there's no trade, so there's nothing to tariff. (laughs) Yeah, you're, you're starting to see the problems here. You're starting to see the problems because, and exactly, American pocketbooks were hit almost immediately, as well as the federal budget. Mm -hmm. And it only took just over a year before it was so unpopular 
that Congress repealed the Embargo Act and replaced it with another non-intercourse act. This one was focused solely on trade with Britain and France and really wasn't that well enforced. So it also has a fun name. <laughs> <laughs> the Non-Intercourse Act. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Also very unpopular. <laughs> nobody, nobody actually knew what it was. They just got confused. Like, oh, I don't want to do a non-intercourse. Oh, oh, it, oh that's what trade, that is. Global trade. Oh, okay. I don't care. I don't care. That's fine. Yeah, put that one in place. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay, cool. I thought it was about. <laughs> exactly. Well, and so this was a disaster, and mm. it was an embarrassing having to walk that back, but Jefferson didn't have to deal with the fallout from that because the Embargo Act was repealed days before he left office. Peace. So with the presidential election of 1808 looming in the midst of all of this Embargo Act madness, mm-hmm. the inevitable question, of course, came up to what's going to happen. And and you, even though Jefferson was saying, oh, well, I don't want to run for a third term, of course he had people, please, you've got to run for a third term. We need you. Right. right. And Jefferson was like, no, not interested, not in the least. And oh, by the way, you know, I'll use that excuse. Washington only served two terms. I'm only going to serve two terms. <laughs> now he could have, and we'll see future presidents that do try and run for more than two terms, but Jefferson was not one of those people. So in the last few months of his term, and this is one of the things, and this is more of a criticism of Jefferson, but he basically just said, I don't want to do anything to (laughs) impede what my successor may do. So I'm going to do nothing. Now it helped. And he may not have been quite that way if he hadn't known who his successor was going to be. He made it clear to everybody in Jefferson's own way. You know, Jefferson always did things kind of behind the scenes, but Mm -hmm. Madison was his guy. And even though there were a couple of attempts to propel either vice president, George Clinton or their friend, James Monroe to the top post. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately between Jefferson's influence and Dolly Madison's charm offensive, Those Mm. efforts came to naught. James Madison got the nomination. He handedly beat out the Federalist candidate to become the fourth president of the United States. As he turned his attention to transitioning from the State Department to the president's house, I think this quote from Leonard White best sums up Madison's tenure as Secretary of State. Quote, For eight years, close harmony prevailed between the two men primarily responsible for foreign policy. It has been said, that perhaps no president and his secretary of state ever worked together with as complete understanding as Jefferson and Madison. So as we go along and and start to wrap up the episode, you know, we will come back to evaluating his time as secretary of state, as well as, you know, his larger life and career. But I just want to take this moment as we're transitioning to remind everybody, just like with the past episode, We are not going to cover his post-cabinet career in too much depth. We're going to try and hit the high levels of it because, of course, we are in the midst of the Madison presidency series in the narrative. We'll cover much more of his presidency and beyond as we go along. But in order to be able to evaluate, we need at least some high-level talking points. Yeah. So spoilers. Spoilers. (laughs) Spoilers. <laughs> if you don't want to be spoiled, you may want to skip to towards the end of the episode. But <laughs> but I think most folks probably know all this anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> so naturally, you know, Madison didn't too, do too bad for himself in his exit from the cabinet because he got to the big seat. He became the president. Bum, 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 bum. Oh, that song didn't exist yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now. Madison was, in fact, the first, but he would not be the last cabinet member to go directly from his cabinet post to become president. And so you're already learning about in the Madison presidency narrative, Madison did not have an easy time as president. First of all, his initial cabinet, other than Secretary of the Treasury Gallatin, was not really the (laughs) A-team. And at times, they would cause more problems than actually bringing solutions to the table. Now, 
initially, and even Gallatin, so Gallatin was one of the key figures in the Jefferson administration, yeah. but he would cause a problem for President Madison because he initially wanted to be Secretary of State. Madison was agreeable to that. He he wanted him to be Secretary of State, but there was that problem of everybody didn't like him, and they saw <laughs> they saw him as being responsible for taking Jefferson to more of a moderate stance and taking him away from true Republicanism. And oh, by the way, did we mention that he has a French accent? So, you know, we don't like that in America. Mm -hmm. So because of this animosity of some key Democratic Republican leaders, Madison instead had to opt to nominate his other Jefferson cabinet colleague, Secretary of the Navy, Robert Smith, to become the new Secretary of State. Yeah. Yeah. This was a decision that Madison would come to regret. Again, we'll talk more about the details when we get to Robert Smith's episode. But after only a couple of years, Madison forced Smith out to be replaced by fellow Virginian James Monroe. Now, with the other cabinet positions, Madison would have to go through one or two alternates before finally finding someone that brought something key to the table. So the initial batch were awful. Sometimes the second person or the third person, not so great. Finally, towards the end of his presidency, he would actually have a pretty solid cabinet. But at that point, it's towards the end of your presidency. So yeah, how only, effective only is it? took me eight years to get here. <laughs> exactly. I finally found the right guy five days before I'm leaving. Yep. <laughs> and this instability in the cabinet would come to hurt his presidency, as would the increased tensions with Great Britain. Things just continue from bad to worse with Great Britain. Yep. And as we all likely know, Madison would ultimately call for a declaration of war with Great Britain, something that Congress would grant, though by a rather slim margin. (laughs) Big mistake. Big mistake. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. And so when people think of the Madison presidency, they typically think of the War of 1812. This is kind of the big thing about the Madison presidency. And mostly it's known as a disaster. So the initial war plans called for a three-pronged attack on the British Canadian provinces. This quickly devolved into failure and chaos because you've got three prongs of the army hundreds of miles away in a time of poor communications. What could go wrong? Meanwhile, the administration would see some successes when General William Henry Harrison was given command of forces in the West, and the U.S. Navy would prove itself against the British. Also, the Battle of New Orleans, of course, a big win for the U.S., but the backdrop of war would also be used as an excuse to decimate Native forces, both in Mm. the Old Northwest and the South. And General Andrew Jackson, with the approval of the Madison administration, forced the cession of over 20 million acres of modern-day Alabama and southern Georgia to the U.S. government for settlement. So this was, you know, it was not a good time for the Native peoples. And this was something that ultimately kind of pushed them even further west. And Jackson did that to his allies. Like, it it was like Jackson fought a war against the Native peoples that some Native peoples supported the Americans on. After he won, he turned to his allies and said, great, now give me your land too. Get out of here. That is the kind of guy that Andrew Jackson was. Yes. Madison, meanwhile, would have to literally flee from the capital. (laughs) Yep. yep. When a British force landed on American soil and marched to Washington, D.C., where they set fire to the nation's capital, which was not a good look for someone who had issued the call to war. So this is your war that has resulted in the burning of the nation's capital. Yep. Now, the Treaty of Ghent, which ended the war, was on the terms of status quo antebellum, which meant that things went back exactly as they were before the war. Can I say Can I say one other important thing about this war? Yes. If I remember right, this is the first war where the United States enjoyed the service of Winfield Scott. Oh, fuss and feathers! Yeah, of course, be part of U.S. history for like the next forever, and as the best nickname ever. I, I just had to bring up old Fuss and Feathers when I had the chance. Every time I hear you talk about Winfield Scott on your <laughs> podcast, I love it. 
<laughs> it puts a smile on my face. <laughs> oh, he is such a delight. And he's and he just keeps popping up. I tell you, nobody pops up more in his history than oh fuss and feathers, one field scat. <laughs> and this is where it all begins. <laughs> yeah, it all begins right here with him basically sitting out there and being like, dude, our army sucks in this war. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get a new army, please? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, <laughs> his write-up of this is like, we had a bunch of old crusty generals who had no idea what they were doing, and it was bad. <laughs> and he was right he was about right. it. That was right. Accurate. <laughs> and so even though this war ends with nothing seemingly accomplished, you know, this is everything has gone back exactly like it was before the war, but some conditions that had led to the war had changed. Namely, the end of the Napoleonic Wars meant that Britain didn't need to rely on impressment. And so yeah. one of the big issues, out of the way. Yeah. And though there were occasional flare-ups from time to time, President Madison had achieved what Secretary of State Madison had been a- unable to do. He attained what was ultimately a lasting peace with Great Britain. <laughs> so we'll at least give him that. <laughs> Wow, that is that is quite. <laughs> he did, he gets a war with Great Britain, but then after the war, we don't have any more wars. So let's give him credit for that. Okay, all right. <laughs> he also oversaw the annexation of Spanish-held West Florida into the United States, which mm-hmm. is, of course, that land on the the Gulf Coast from Baton Rouge over to Mobile. Now, he and his administration were a bit underhanded in the way that they did this which we discuss in the narrative series, but they did manage to acquire this territory without going to war with Spain. Though Madison was unable to prevent Congress from shuttering the first bank of the United States in 1811, he and his administration were able to shepherd in the chartering of the second bank of the United States a few years later. After everybody realized that you needed that to fund the war... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> after you go they, to war with britain where you you've you've gotten rid of your foreign trade so you have no tariff money you've closed your bank so you can't borrow money you're anti-tax so you can't tax anybody how are you supposed to pay for that thing and afterwards like okay let, let, bank hmm. was a good idea. let's bring that bank back <laughs> Shoot. yeah after you try everything else you get yeah. back to the right idea which was the starting idea yeah So, despite leading the nation into a war that was unpopular in the Northeast, Madison was successful in his bid for re-election in 1812. But after two terms, he decided he would follow the precedent of Washington and Jefferson, and probably quite gladly, and leave after two terms. So, in 1817, James and Dolly left the president's house, returned to Madison's homestead, Montpelier. And, as we'll see more in detail in Madison's post-presidency episode, he spent the majority of the rest of his life at Montpelier managing the plantation and struggling to sustain himself and his family financially. And in part, his stepson Payne Todd would prove to be a major financial drag. James and Dolly were constantly sending him money and paying off his massive debts from gambling and cavorting up and down the eastern seaboard. It got so bad that Todd ended up in debtor's prison at one point, and the Madisons had to turn to friends to help secure his release. It was a bad situation. Bad situation. As Madison found himself going further into debt, his plantation, along with others in the area, suffered several bad harvests between 1819 and 1825. Madison tried to resist turning to the same remedy that other Virginia planters did in selling some of the people that were enslaved at Montpelier, But he wasn't always able to avoid it. Sometimes he did sell some of the enslaved individuals at the plantation. Beyond dealing with financial woes and managing Montpelier, he did have a few projects to occupy his time. The first of which was in helping to see through a dream of his longtime friend Thomas Jefferson, which was to establish a world-class public institution of higher learning in Charlottesville, Virginia. Mm Mm-hmm. And Jefferson would spend the last years of his life seeing this through the University of Virginia, which was the institution that he helped found, opened in 1825. And naturally, Jefferson wanted his right-hand man to help him. Madison helped with the initial, as well as when Jefferson passed away in 1826, Madison succeeded Jefferson as the rector of the university, 
which was a position he would retain until his death. Madison was also chosen as a representative to the Virginia Constitutional Convention in 1829. Oh, yeah. Yeah, which allowed James and Dolly the opportunity to travel to Richmond and see some old friends and colleagues, get reacquainted with them. Now, this convention did fail to resolve the issue of apportionment that had led to it being called in the first place, but it was still seen as being one of those key moments because you've got Madison, you've got Monroe, you've got some of these older figures in Mm -hmm. Virginia politics showing up again. Now, Madison's final project had a dual purpose, preserving his historical legacy and ensuring that his wife, Dolly, would be taken care of financially upon his demise. Madison, along with Dolly and her brother, John, worked on gathering, cataloging, and organizing Madison's papers, particularly Mm. those involving the Constitutional Convention of 1787, which, you know, Mm -hmm. we talked about his extensive note-taking, and that's really how we know about the debates of that convention. Yep. Now, James believed that the publication of these papers would provide Dolly with a viable income for the rest of her life. That didn't turn out to be the case, but you can see why he would think that it would work out well. Yeah, yeah. Now, we should also note that Madison was not adverse to editing his papers. Mm. As he saw it, it was important for ensuring that he was understood to posterity. But of course, all these edits were intended to put him in a better light. Absolutely. With the economic pressures that he was facing, family issues, historian Drew McCoy described And especially thinking of his historical legacy, you know, historian Drew McCoy describes that these anxieties could at times be physically debilitating. Hmm. Quote, literally sick with anxiety, he began to despair of his ability to make himself understood by his fellow citizens. Hmm. And Madison had never really enjoyed good health. You know, he had had bouts and from time to time. But in his final years, he just he was increasingly debilitated. And finally, on June 28th, 1836, James Madison took his last breath and passed away at Montpelier at the age of 85. Three key takeaways about Madison's post-cabinet career. Number one, for better or worse, Madison's career and legacy were linked with Thomas Jefferson. Mm-hmm. Number two, winning an election and running an effective administration are two completely different things. <laughs> yeah. Number three, it's good to have projects to keep one occupied during retirement, but when you become <laughs> physically ill with worry while getting lost reevaluating your past, perhaps there's a better project out there for you. It's possible. It's possible. I, I gotta say, though, I feel like one of the big lessons of history is it's really good to be the person who gets to write the history. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Exactly. You want to be that person. Yeah. No, that didn't really happen that way. Let's let's right. put in the and then I flew in riding a dragon. <laughs> exactly. Save the day. I was ten feet tall. Yeah, I was 10, exactly. <laughs> and all the ladies batted their eyes at me, but I was like, "No, ladies, I've got Dolly. Dolly's on my mind." Mm-hmm. Now, naturally. There are tons of landmarks and geographical features named after Madison, but I just want to hit on a couple of key highlights of his his physical legacy that's still around. So first of all, his home Montpelier is, of course, a National Historic Landmark. Mm -hmm. It's managed by a private foundation, which has been in the news as of late due to a back and forth involving the descendants of people who were enslaved at the plantation oh, yeah, yeah. and getting them involved in the management of the estate. Yeah. Ultimately, in May 2022, so just a few months before this recording, full parity on the board of directors was achieved, which will hopefully help to ensure that the full story of all who lived at Montpelier will be told for future generations. That's good. So I think Madison would also appreciate the next one, one of the buildings at the Library of Congress was named in honor of him after its construction in the 1970s and is home to many of the library's reading rooms. Mm. Also, the James Madison Memorial Fellowship Foundation was created in 1986 in the lead up to the bicentennial of the drafting of the U.S. Constitution. And this foundation works to encourage secondary school teachers to continue studies focused on the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. 
Also, Madison Square Garden, which is located at Madison Square in Manhattan, bears yeah. the name of the fourth U.S. president, as do Madison, Wisconsin, and Madison County, Alabama. Shoot. The institution, now known as James Madison University, was founded in 1908 and changed its name to Madison College in 1938 to honor the president whose estate is not far from the college's campus. I believe they're playing their first college football season this year, and they're five and three right now. By the way, oh wow! Uh, yeah, they started off five and zero oh at the at the current level, so uh, they, they got a pretty good season going over there. Wow! And Madison would be in the crowd cheering. <laughs> he would not be on the field playing. He would. He would be oh, cool if you were no. There. He would be. He, he, he'd be like, I'm not even. I'm not even stepping on the field. Yeah. <laughs> and though Madison was not necessarily big on war. The submarine USS James Madison was named after him. It launched in March 1963 and served for decades until it was decommissioned in November 1992. You know, I was on a walk the other day. There's a James Madison school right by me. It's wow. Everywhere. Yeah. 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 And so, Kenny, we have a, a job to do because we need to evaluate this life and legacy and career. And this is a big one. but. Mm-hmm. We shall see how he turns out. So we're going to start with our whole picture round, which this round looks at the overall career and character of the cabinet member. And just as a reminder, we can each award him up to 10 points. Okay. So Kenny, what are your thoughts on James Madison's life and career? Um, so, so life and career, is this, is this like everything or is this outside the administration or is this like all up? All of it. You know, I feel like when I think of James Madison all up, I, I, I end up giving him around like a six or a five. And I, I think I might be more critical than most. I'll be curious what you give him. And he certainly does achieve a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe I should give him more. Because, you know, if we're talking about like, I mean, he became president. He does he does all this stuff. Okay, you know what? I'm going to revise this. I'm going to get take some points off later because while he achieves a lot, I think he also makes a lot of mistakes. I'm going to give him, let's give him a uh, nine uh, on the score because he uh, is involved in in many different government posts, uh, like early coming on up. He's a big uh, person in writing and and at the Constitutional Convention, creating a new convention, uh, the Bill of Rights. Uh, When George Washington becomes president, James Madison spends the first few weeks writing letters to himself, you know, from Madison to the Congress to Madison. But he's, you know, uh, Washington to Congress and whatever, but it's all him. He becomes secretary of state. He becomes president. He certainly has like at the end of life, when you're looking at end of life resumes, he's got a really good end of life resume. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to give him a nine for that. And I'm going to be more harsh in other categories. I think that's fair. And I'm, I'm debating it's going to be high because to your point, Kenny, you look at his overall career, you don't get any higher in the U S than president. I mean, that's, that's an achievement. Yeah. And he was, you know, a member of the constitutional convention, which established the form of government that we still have to the present day. He was one of the leading proponents for the ratification of that, constitution Mm -hmm. he wrote the bill of rights he managed to get that pushed through the early days of the the early republic he's by and large in charge of of making things happen you know he's he's one of the key wheelers and dealers in the early republic i think we have to go high here i think i'm going to go just slightly lower than you and say 8.5 and that's Only because even though he became president, it didn't turn out so well. You know, right, right, exactly. I'm like, there (laughs) there were some problems there. Ultimately, you know, and and that's the interesting thing. Like when he left the presidency, he was by and large well respected. You know, people were started to revere him as the this elder statesman. So it wasn't that he was leaving completely in disgrace. But it was a rocky road to get there, and so I'm I'm going absolutely yeah we're we're, we're going to be yeah. dinging him I think in, in these next categories it's in this first oh, one yeah. it's like when you like if you just look and you laid out the resumes of uh, this is cabinet so all the mm-hmm. cabinet people in U.S. history 
this is probably like the most impressive resume uh, in terms of pre and post and everything, you know? Yeah. It, and if it's not, it, it's like one of the, it's like the top 1%. So that's where I'm like, all right, I feel like I got to give them nine, even though I'm, we're about to tear them up. <laughs> so the categories. And, and I say, let's get to it in our next one. So the go-getter. So this round looks at the impact of the cabinet member during their time in the cabinet. And again, just like the previous round, we can each award him up to 10 points. All right. So I, I feel like my question is, we talk about impact. Does it have to be a good impact for him to get points? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know? I think I think there's an argument there. And because, and that's the thing, and this leads into kind of um, previous discussions that we've had. And I'm thinking of, it's a bit different, but this was a discussion that we had with Timothy Pickering when yeah. we had his episode because Timothy Pickering had a huge impact on the Washington and Adams administrations. It wasn't always good. Right. In this case, it's, you know, Timothy Pickering was more about opposing and, and especially with John Adams opposing the president. And that was his impact. In this case, you do see Jefferson and Madison working very close hand in hand together. You, mm. you get the sense, even if they may have had a discussion behind the scenes that maybe they talk things out in public, there was no daylight between them. They were right. in, in sync. They presented a united front but to your point, was it always a good thing? Right. Like here, here's where some of the top things that bubbled in my mind is I'm like, first off, he had a good relationship with his boss. So that's good. Really good relationship with Jefferson. That's mm -hmm. worth some points. Uh, in terms of the other people, I had Secretary of State, he's supposed to have good relations with the ambassadors. He did not. So that's negative some points, you know. And then what are the top things that happened on his watch? You know, like I think of, uh, the the embargo act and, and non intercourse act things like that he he made things happen you know like he had an impact he he those things happened but they weren't the results were bad you know the results were very bad um that the like these things got so bad I, I'm sure you're going to cover parts of the country thought about seceding from the United States because mm -hmm. of how unpopular these laws were and how negatively impactful they were on different parts of the country so impact yes he had an impact <laughs> was it a good one not always i'm i'm gonna kind of split the difference and i'll i think i'll put him around a, a six here um good relationships with his boss bad relationships with the rest of the world uh the the only wars while he is secretary of state if i remember right uh tripoli you know barbary mm -hmm. pirates which you could argue was a good war i mean we went in there we won no negative consequences really uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll give him a, a six. We're, we're really most of the points off for just how disastrous the embargo act was. Yeah. Well, and, and also the fact that, you know, even beyond diplomatic relations and having these diplomats that he just did not get along with things, things weren't going good. Also the fact that even with party leaders, he didn't always get along with them. Mm -hmm. And they saw him as having this negative impact. I didn't mention it in the, uh, you know, as we were going along, but there would be friction between him and James Monroe during this time because Monroe had been sent as U.S. Minister to Britain and negotiated a treaty called the Monroe Pinckney Treaty. And basically, it it wasn't what the administration wanted. It didn't address impressment. It didn't address a few other things, but it addressed a couple of minor issues. And Monroe wrote back and pushed for it to go through because he was like, look, we just need something. At least we can get these couple of issues off the table and come back and re-engage. So this was a, a pragmatic thing that Monroe was doing and Madison advocated and Jefferson agreed. They didn't even send the treaty to the Senate. They just said, we're just going to sit on it. We're not taking any action. And it died a quiet death in, mm. in a drawer. And Monroe was naturally upset. He's like, what are you doing? This is, this is a pragmatic approach. We're, we're getting at least a little something. 
and it made him look bad. And so there was bad blood between them for years. And that also caused problems, you know, in the transition to his own presidency because Monroe was on the other side. He, even though he was a Democratic Republican, he was in the opposition. Took yeah. him a couple of years to to get that worked out. So again, like this impact, it it really isn't that good for the administration. So I think I'm going to match you in that six. I think in terms of running the day to day and keeping peace within the cabinet, mm-hmm. Madison did a good job, but there just weren't that many achievements. And then some things that Madison proposed or fought for didn't turn out well for the administration. So I think right. I, I really don't think we can give him full marks here. A little I'm above. Say, yeah. Yeah. As a quick aside, the James Monroe, James Madison relationship is so interesting because it just keeps going from like rivals to friends to rivals to friends to rivals to friends, like over and over and over again. I, I'm i suddenly wondering if there's like any books on like James and James. That'd be just like an interesting relationship to study. Absolutely. It, and I'm actually working on a, a narrative um, episode now where James Monroe is coming back as Secretary of State. And so I'm go. seeing that shift happening and it's right. just, it is fascinating. It's like, wow. And that's one of those, you know, when you've got those, those frenemies in yeah. Yeah. <laughs> American politics. <laughs> so, and, and I think that's a good lead in to our next round, which is the hot seat round. So this round discusses any disgraceful behavior of or actions committed by the cabinet member. And this disgrace does not have to be during their tenure of office in the cabinet. And this is where we will actually take away points and we can each take away up to 10 points. Yeah. Um, let's see. So I, I think, you know, first thing, slave owner, got to take yeah. away a point there. Uh, did, did nothing really good for his slaves. Like he didn't set them free or anything. No. I'm trying to remember what what's the latest research on did he father any children with his slaves? Do you know by chance? So we don't have any DNA evidence. However, there is a, a griot, uh, Betty Curse, who released a book a couple of years ago. And in her family oral tradition, the family oral tradition says that they are descended from James Madison. Interesting. And with that, and and she has actually engaged with folks at James Madison's Montpelier. She's engaged mm-hmm. with the the Montpelier Descendants Society, so she is heavily involved and and seen as a descendant of James Madison. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that's the only instance that we know of, and that is in yeah. play here. Yeah. So so. Sounds like very likely was yeah. hooking up with the slaves, <laughs> having yeah. affairs with them, which uh, I, I don't care. Yeah, every now and then I'll see someone who's like, well, maybe it was a relationship. I'm like, no, if you own the other person, it was rape. You were yeah. raping people. Yeah. So that's not good. Uh, it's terrible. Um, in, in terms of other scandals, there was that election early in his career where he refused to buy alcohol and so nobody voted for him. That was quite the scandal. <laughs> um, now uh I, I think those are kind of the two big um personal life scandals that i would say that come to mind and then in terms of uh as a politician seems like he was a fairly honest one you know no stories of him uh basically you know theft or anything from public office but he did involve in a lot of the seedy parts of politics also. He was involved with James mm-hmm. Callender and he was involved. I mean, he's one of the reasons we had political parties and started tearing the country apart, you know. So I, I'd say points off for those areas mm-hmm. and the way he went about his politics. Um, so let's see, is, is the number we give the number of negative points? Like I, I'll say like yes. negative, um, I'll say like negative seven, you know. And and my thoughts there are it's like a, a few negative points for personal life, the owning the slavery, the rape um, of those slaves. I'll say some points off for the, the skullduggery of politics, the things that we don't like, the involvement with James Callender the, and, and all that stuff. And where he doesn't lose points is no, no points off for personally profiting uh, in, in a corrupt way from his positions at any point um, that I'm aware of. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. And, 
you know, we are going to have many more cabinet members to discuss that were, that did enslave individuals. James Madison is one of those. And as we've talked about before, you know, there is no, there's no way to quantify the, the awful impact and, and the, the horror and evil of slavery. So, right. you know, we, we do what we can and we try and take into account other aspects of disgrace and, and dishonor. And I think you hit on some key ones. You know, he, he was involved in the politics, both above the board and what was happening kind of behind the scenes, the more seedy details. Also, as president, basically with West Florida, they he had said for years West Florida was part of the Louisiana Purchase. And so when the Spanish American revolutions began, he saw this as an opportunity. Okay, well, we have some folks down there who are interested. They're not a majority, but we'll send word to them that if they call a convention, if they ask for annexation, if they ask for us to come in, we'll come in. And that's exactly mm. what happened. He made sure that the right people were in the right place and that they had troops ready to move in when it came time. Tried something similar in East Florida, didn't work out so well, but you know, you see this pragmatism working even with, well, we want this, so we'll figure out some way to make it happen, even if it's not really above the board. And then also going back to the issue of slavery. So at the end of his life, um, his private secretary when he was president, Edward Coles, had urged him for years. So Coles was anti-slavery. He actually moved to Illinois with the enslaved people that he had. He released them. He freed them. He gave them money. He tried to help them get established as he was establishing himself as well. And Coles tried to encourage Madison. He's like, the best thing for your legacy would be if you freed all the people that you enslaved, if you made sure that they had what they needed to get started. And Coles thought that Madison had agreed. And then when Madison passed away and his will was read, no. Mm. No. And so and it ended up the enslaved people at Montpelier because Dolly Madison really wasn't invested in Montpelier. She was invested in her son, Payne. And to make ends meet, to pay for his debts, they started selling the enslaved people to the point that there was nobody left. Mm -hmm. And that was just awful and abysmal families being separated. And I think that Madison does bear some responsibility for that as well. So all this is to say that I agree. I think a negative seven is, is justified, you know, as a public servant, it doesn't seem like he did anything for personal profit and by and large, when it came to his white family, it does seem that Madison was that that person that everybody turned to. He tried to help support folks. He tried to help up and coming politicians. But there's definitely some disgrace there that we need to account for. So, yeah. And with that, with the points that we have thus far, James Madison is at a 15.5. Mm -hmm. Now he gets the chance to add a few more points starting with the tenure of office. So this is the entire time that a cabinet member served in a full-time capacity. So he served as secretary of state from, he didn't make it the full eight years. Uh, he took office on May 2nd, 1801, and he served mm -hmm. until March 3rd, 1809, but we're going to round up and he'll get the eight points there. Now, there are a couple of bonus points, so mm -hmm. he's not going to get the first two because he only served in one full-time cabinet position as Secretary of State, and he also only served as a full-time cabinet member in one administration, so he doesn't get that other bonus point. Mm -hmm. But he does get the bonus point because he is a cabinet member who became a president, so he's, mm. he's one of those lucky few. Yep. And with that, his total comes to 24.5 which is a pretty good score. 
It's actually one of the higher ones yeah. that we've had. But now we've got to ask ourselves one more question. Kenny, after all I've shared about James Madison's life and career and what we've discussed, do you think that he is notable enough or impactful enough to earn a seat at the table of the cabinet all stars? It's it like I feel like he is because of the impact he had. But I would also say that if you were like Kenny, do you want this person in your cabinet? <laughs> Say no, <laughs> because his ideas so often didn't pan out right, you know. So, uh, it, you know, for measuring for impact, for significance, yeah, yeah. I mean, he just was. He was a he was an all star impactor, um, and I'm I'm almost chagrined that he has as many points as he has <laughs> because I, I just look at so many of his ideas and I'm like, well, that didn't work out, and that was annoying, and why did he do that? Uh, but yeah, I, I put him at the all star table. What about you? I'm going to agree with you, and that's the thing. Whenever you look at, and speaking of his cabinet career, we see many instances where either cabinet members end up in opposition to the administration or are just serving their own interest or are just completely, you don't even hardly know they're there. You knew James Madison was there as Secretary of State, and you knew he was always going to be supporting Jefferson and the administration, no matter what. You know, even when his wife was gravely ill, yes, he put her first, and he was still trying to do everything he could from afar. He was stretching himself thin, trying to do all that he could because he did have this sense of service to the administration, to the post. And in that sense, he is the person that you want at the table. Just maybe don't always listen to his ideas, brainstorm them a little bit, talk through some of the details, you know, and then maybe come to a decision. But I think that he does earn that seat at the table. So congratulations to James Madison. You somehow managed. You to, snuck in. <laughs> you <laughs> snuck in and. Even Thomas Jefferson did not get a seat at the table. So this is wow. one instance that he surpassed Jefferson. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> and with that, Kenny, thank you so much for your time, for this conversation, for revisiting James Madison with me. I greatly appreciate it. And I hope you know, as you know, I know it's been a while for you exploring the, the life and career of James Madison in terms of your podcast. I hope that this has been a nice refresher and, and maybe a few more details that, that you didn't get to in your research. It was. It, it was fun to dive back into Madison and you were definitely able to hit some areas that like I didn't in my episode. So I hope my listeners enjoyed this as well. Anyone who came over to check it out. Uh, always, always a pleasure, Jay. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Thank you, Kenny. And Please, once you get done with this episode, check out Abridged Presidential Histories. I'll be sharing information around the release of this episode. There will also be a link on the page for this episode on the website, which is presidenciespodcast.com. Kenny, thank you again. Our listeners, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, stay safe and healthy, be kind to one another, and take care, dear friends. Hi, listeners. My name's Ray Suarez, and I wanted to take a moment to tell you about another podcast from Evergreen Podcasts, the things I thought about when my body was trying to kill me. In this podcast, I share with you a personal story over the several months where I had to think hard about the end. Join me, Ray Suarez, as I journey through this battle with cancer on my new podcast. Listen to the things I thought about when my body was trying to kill me by following us on your favorite podcast app today.